we have Jason Ye from Spotify uh, with us, who is uh, going to talk about BAPO model uh, and its application in Spotify R&D. Jason, all yours. So as mentioned, my name is uh, Jason Yip. I'm currently a senior agile coach at Spotify, and I'm going to talk about uh, something I tried uh, within the Spotify advertising R&D area, uh, a model uh, called BAPO, uh, which is for organizational design. Um, I'm going to try to go through all of this um, before taking questions, but feel free to add them. Um, and yeah, if I see something quick, I might um, comment on it, but otherwise I'll try to get through it just so um, um, we can get uh, talk more at the end about uh, what you think about this. Um, just want to first describe the problem context uh, that uh, we were dealing with um, um, and sort of the, the reason why it was exploring this model. So I don't know how familiar you are with uh, the uh, Spotify in terms of uh, business model and uh, trends. Uh, this is comes from the latest quarterly report, uh, just showing the different um, levels of growth of advertising, as well as the growth of the users on Spotify. MAU stands for monthly active users. Main idea here is really that uh, advertising is growing in impact and size at Spotify, a uh, growing percentage of revenue. Um, usually like growth comes from free users, free users off of advertising. It's just the importance is growing. Now, what that means uh, effectively is that the uh, influence and size of Spotify advertising will grow as well, uh, which means that there will be pressures on structure. Um, more specifically, at the time uh, that I was exploring this, we had just acquired Megaphone. Uh, Megaphone is a uh, company that um, provides uh, essentially a way for uh, different publishers uh, to advertise. Um, and we acquired them so that we could support our own efforts. Um, and associated that, we were engaging uh, in some more complex delivery. Uh, this has already been uh, uh, announced and, and launched. Uh, but at the time, we were working on this thing called uh, the Spotify Audience Network, um, which is a much more complex delivery just because uh, various different areas were working at the same time. And uh, we were working on uh, some pre-existing collaboration issues. So we're just noticing that across different product areas, we're having trouble uh, working together effectively. Uh, so all these factors uh, combined uh, indicated that it might be time to uh, revisit structure. Uh, these type of problems aren't, aren't always uh, structural issues, but I've at least indicated that there might be some issues with boundaries and how we work together across them. So the framing question, the question I was asking, uh, given this context, was how might we approach org design in a more systemic, uh, logical way? Now, some of this comes from uh, a previous experience I had uh, working with another area, uh, uh, which was related to messaging marketing uh, technology. Um, but with the advertising things, it was a little bit uh, larger scale, uh, but still the sim similar idea. And I thought it was worth um, approaching this in a more systemic, logical way. So the, the idea that I had to start was this uh, concept, uh, this phrase called structure follows strategy. It's a kind of a simple a phrase originally from this guy named Alfred D. Chandler Jr. Um, the actual original quote is, unless structure follows strategy and efficiency results, um, which I just normally just uh, would express as structure should follow strategy. The BAPO model uh, comes from someone called uh, Jan Bosch. Uh, I kind of interpret as a expansion of fleshed out expression of structure follows strategy. Uh, this is actually a colleague appointed me to this, and I thought, oh, okay, this this actually seems a much more uh, interesting uh, a version of structure file strategy, and it's worth exploring as a way to think about uh, this problem. Um, as with all models, this isn't uh, like this is not equivalent to reality, but it it's closer and um, possibly more useful. Uh, so we said, okay, let's let's take a look at this and see if this helps out. Now. Um, here, I might as well uh, define the term. So I said BAPL, what does it stand for? Um, essentially, it's business architecture process and organization, where business refers to, or at least I interpret it as product strategy, um, architecture is technical architecture, uh, process, um, also known as ways of working, 
and then finally structures, organizational structure. So the idea um, is that that the kind of primary driver is business, then architecture, then process and organization. Um, even though there are interrelationships between that, that's how you want to primarily drive things uh, rather than uh, the opposite uh, direction. So I was actually talking um, previously uh, uh, with some people about um, like people copying the Spotify model, if you will. And that tendency to start with structural things rather than strategy things is almost like a reflection of, of this kind of mistake um, of uh, structure driving strategy rather than the opposite where it should be following strategy. So it should not be the first thing you look at. Okay. So just to expand on each thing, uh, each uh, item, uh, just to better understand it, the, if we look at business, uh, um, essentially product strategy, the idea here is really around different categories in the product life cycle. So uh, if you look at any product, it does go through different stages. Um, initially, it could be uh, innovative as in you're exploring a potential new product, you're not quite sure what will work and you're running lots of experiments. And how you even measure uh, success is different because you're looking at um, how many experience you're running. Not everything actually is, gets past that initial innovation. Uh, then you'll get something that has traction and now you're trying to differentiate, exploit uh, this new product you have. You're trying to maximize business value. And eventually every product becomes commodity where it's no longer um, a differentiator. You're not really improving business value. You're really just focused on trying to minimize ownership. Each of these stages imply different success criteria as well as different ways of working. Uh, so it's important to categorize uh, what where a product is because then it affects how you do, again, all the, the subsequent steps. Um, typically, when you look at this, you're looking as well at, at product capabilities, not like an overall product. Uh, the next stage is architecture, uh, the next phase architecture. And this is really about decoupling and dependencies. Uh, the general simple way of thinking about this is uh, stable things should not depend on volatile things. So you have this kind of one way dependency and you also want to decouple. So something uh, like let's say a service associated with a capability, um, you don't want it to depend like one service supporting both a volatile and a stable a capability because now you've coupled two things that should be isolated. A process is about ways of working. Again, as mentioned, depending on what stage uh, the product is at or the product capability is that you want to work in different ways. In an innovation, we may want to do lots of parallel experiments um, and differentiating what you do your kind of typical iterative incremental development and commodity you might outsource, use third-party services, et cetera, just because the appropriate ways of working um, uh, changes because you are trying to do different things. Um, and finally, organization is about a staffing allocation and team structure. Uh, the first, uh, the idea about staffing allocation is that for something that like product capabilities that are commodity as in you're no longer getting business value out of it, it's no longer experimental, um, and you're you're just trying to reduce costs. So you don't really want to look at your staffing and saying most of your effort there. You want to minimize how much effort you, you allocate to this as much as possible. Um, after that, between differentiating and uh, innovation, it's more of a judgment call. So this is a, uh, a kind of a decision based on your product strategy about how much allocation you want to have toward innovation um, experimental things versus differentiating. And this kind of, if you think about it in terms of revenue, you're not really making money off of innovation things yet. Uh, they're really more for the future. So depending on your situation, how much you can afford to say, hey, we're planning for the future versus we need to kind of deal with what gives us benefit now. Uh, that is a, a call that needs to be made um, at a, a business department level about what is appropriate. Um, Again, this is why um, from the model, the business strategy stuff comes first. It, it determines how you think about uh, things like this. Okay, so the general idea I had, so that, that's the model, but the general idea I had for what I was attempting to do with this um, was, to, had, was two things. One is to inject this idea of BAPO, this model of starting from business to architecture to process to organization to inject this idea into the general narrative. So 
when the larger like Spotify advertising R and D was was going through organizational design discussions and and decisions, um, people involved in that discussion would be aware of this model, these concepts, and that would influence um, how they would go about it. Um, and that that I was saying, hey, that's a minimum thing. I just want the narrative to be out there so that people have these concepts and then they can think about it while they're they're deciding things. The ideal though was to say, hey, I'll introduce BAPO and then it will we'll directly create a, a target operating model to directly influence uh, the org design. So that was the, the idea. Um, in order to go about this, I had particular principles for how to do this change. Um, the first one, starting um, where you are, as in uh, whatever I had uh, control and influence over, that's where I would start. I wouldn't try to go somewhere where I didn't have capability. Um, use existing resources, um, whatever assets or um, essentially people I already had influence over, I'd start there. Um, person by person buy-in um, also can be described as ground war or the Japanese term is namawashi, as in um, you're not trying to convince everyone at else, you're actually everyone at, at once, you are actually talking to each person and getting buy-in uh, person by person in order to get the collective agreement which is a lot of work, but tends to be more effective at getting overall buy-in. And finally, to frame as an experiment. So using, uh, saying, hey, there's this thing I discovered. It might be interesting. I'm not saying it works. Uh, just to make it more comfortable for people to engage with it because um, it's not a uh, lower pressure, uh, but also uh, encourages more questions and uh, exploration. Just creates a particular mindset, which I think is appropriate um, and useful for these type of changes. Um, so what actually happened? Uh, right from the start, uh, when I was introducing this, I didn't really have enough context in the business strategy to be able to say, hey, um, this is our current product strategy, business strategy, um, and uh, therefore, you know, this is what our architecture should look like, and so on and so forth. Um, so I could only really use uh, pre-existing artifacts, which we didn't have anything pre-existing, like in terms of a product capability map or anything like that. But we did have existing high-level architecture diagrams. If you're familiar with the C4 approach, uh, like Sam Brown talks about, there's this idea of a high-level context diagram. So it's almost like the interface between uh, technical services and business concepts. We did have stuff like that, so I could use those to give a, create an initial kind of straw uh, diagram of high-level architecture, which are were indicative, even though they're not quite identical to product capabilities, and use as an initial uh, talking point. Um, so this is an example of starting where I was, using whatever resources was available to get going, um, knowing full well uh, that I would iterate on this model. So it wasn't necessary to start with a perfect expression of product strategy and architecture, I could just start with um, an initial idea and then, again, framing as an experiment, framing an iteration, be able to engage with people. Um, the next thing, uh, so the general idea is I'd have this straw man um, architecture thing, start validating with people, framing as an experiment, um, migrate to more people as this thing started refining. So I went from, specifically, I went from a senior engineer uh, because it was starting kind of technical uh, but this person had uh, also quite a good familiarity with the business domain and then migrate to product leads um, and then finally to the broader leads of the overall mission. Uh, overall mission just refers to the overall R&D area. Um, so create an initial straw man, use existing architecture as a proxy, validate with senior engineer, followed by one-on-ones with the product leads, then finally with the overall mission leads. Um, and this was the approach. So just to be a little bit more concrete, this is an example of the straw man I created. The actual one is uh, much more involved, but, um, and also if you're not that familiar with advertising concepts, it's not really that relevant, but just to give you a sense of, hey, I have all these things um, um, grouping within those categories I mentioned before in BAPO and the product life cycle. So which are services that we kind of thought, okay, these are kind of commodity things. They're not really differentiating, no customer cares. Um, that we have them, we just need to have them there. Differentiating things that are kind of known things that uh, we know that if we get better at customers, we'll pay more money for it, and so on. 
and innovation things, I, I wasn't quite sure what was in there. So I just had this kind of question mark. Um, so I had this, this is what I brought forward to a senior engineer. And then from there, uh, talking to product leads, we have this kind of uh, more involved version. Again, this is still simplified, but gives a sense of how it evolved. So um, one, I guess, first point here, I put these things in red here. Some of the language started to change. So, and this is kind of thing, also a useful thing. I started translating the language, both from the official language, from the model to what was uh, connecting better, uh, especially with the product lead. So uh, people were from more familiar with the Kano model. Um, if you're familiar with that, just this idea of, of hygiene, uh, I think differentiation in um, the lighting type things. So some very similar concepts. So when we say commodities saying, oh no, this is a hygiene, what are hygiene product capabilities? Uh, one, one thing for sure is talking to product leads, they were able to translate from the technical service to what how they would talk about product capabilities, how customers would understand it, which I was able to introduce the split. Uh, but then also this language from commodity to hygiene, uh, clarify that differentiating meant that things that we know that if we do them, they convert to money, like it's relatively well known, so we're relatively confident versus innovation uh, capabilities, which we're not sure that they work yet. So we don't know that if we do this, we don't know if customers care, it's very experimental. So that helped clarify, okay, where do the things go? Um, much better than the original language. Um, so, and this is kind of, I think, a good tactic to generally take. Um, what was useful at this point, I think as well, is that we could detect misalignment here um, uh, quite quickly. Um, and which itself was useful, even if um, this model didn't lead to anything, at least it picked up misalignment issues. Um, while validating with uh, product leads, I also added uh, current teams and allocations. So, hey, how many people are associated with each um, category, uh, which then we could think about, hey, does, does this make strategic sense? Like, should we be do we have too, too many people working on particular things? Um, and finally, I presented to the mission leads um, as a summary. Uh, this is kind of this, this blob is kind of blurred out, but um, this is actually more reflective of how the overall thing looked. Um, and then we kind of went from there. Now, I'm going to talk about like how this worked out um, and I think what the lessons are. So again, back in the beginning, I said that at a minimum, I wanted to inject BAPO into the narrative um, as a minimum and then try to use this to directly influence the target operating model to directly influence the org design. Um, I think I was able to achieve the first thing, and I don't really think I was successful in the second thing. Um, so let's talk about lessons here. Um, I think BAPO is a useful model um, in general, and that's why also why I'm talking about this, because I think even for uh, sharing this with you, I think it's something that I would encourage you to take a look at. It's a useful way to think about org design. Um, I also think the change tactics that I attempted, starting where you are using ex existing resources, person-by-person buy-in, from his experiment were effective. They got people engaged. Um, the failure I think I had was uh, when I engaged with the mission leads. And I'm gonna call this, don't try to teach uh, level three leaders to fish. By level three, I mean leaders of leaders of leaders. Um, and I think everyone's familiar with this phrase, give someone a fish, you feed them for a day, teach them how to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. Um, and I think with level three plus leaders, um, they don't typically fish directly, if you will, if I'm going to follow that metaphor. Um, people at that level typically delegate fishing to other people. Um, and if you go in there trying to teach them how to fish where they typically delegate that, you don't get much engagement um, nor a good response. Uh, to some extent, I'd say if you're engaging with a leader at that level, just tell, give them the fish um, and be prepared to explain how the fishing works only if they ask. But for the most part, I should have just said, here's the conclusion. Um, what happened instead is that there was a bit of confusion and I don't think the message came across clearly. So which is why I think it only ended up um, getting the narrative through there, but didn't really directly influence uh, how they were approaching things per se. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit more uh, about uh, what um, I did and some links more for the BAPO model. I also wrote a blog post um, about this. Um, and there's also a, a newer version of BAPO called ESAO that Jan Bosch came up with. Um, I actually still like BAPO. I think it's a simpler way to think about it, but um, we're checking that out too.
Um, but that's um, all I wanted to say, and let's shift to questions. Thanks a lot, Jason. Uh, I think we are just a little over time. Uh, thanks a lot, Jason. Uh, it was a very insightful session. 